presentation of the South Carolina Educational Television Network. Major funding for the Voices and Visions series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Annenberg Media. Additional series funding is provided by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. This poem is called Fall 1961, and um, it was a period when the Cold War got quite hot, and there was a Berlin crisis, and um, there were peace marches in London, and Bertrand Russell was making statements, and uh, if an airplane flew over your house in New York, you shuddered a little bit. Fall 1961, back and forth, back and forth goes the talk, talk, talk of the orange, bland, ambassadorial face of the moon on the grandfather clock. Fall, autumn, the chafe and jar of nuclear war. We have talked our extinction to death. A father's no shield for his child. We're like a lot of wild spiders crying together, but without tears. Nature holds up a mirror one swallow makes a summer. It's easy to tick off the minutes, but the clock can stick. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. My one point of rest is the orange and black oriole swinging nest. Those lines about the spider are curious that um, my daughter, who was aged about five, I think, at the time, um, happened to be listening to a radio program, and. Anton Babern's music came on, and I said, this is music you won't like. It's difficult for grown-ups, and uh, asked her what it sounded like, and she said, it's like a lot of wild wolves through the woods walking. Then she said, it's like wild ants, red ants. And uh, then she said this amazing thing, that it's, it's like a lot of wild spiders crying, but without tears. And, uh, that isn't her language. It's just it was some curious something that hit on her intuition. I stole it from her. <laughs> I read Skunk Hour. I suppose that's my most popular poem, and I'm rather sick of it. But um, it's about a little, roughly about a little. Main town where I go in the summer, and uh, the summer is ending, and uh, the town is in decline, the village is in decline, and um, the first four stanzas sort of describe examples of the decline. Then the poem shifts rather in mood and stiffens, and um, gets more dramatic, and the speaker goes out in his car, which is a, a two door Ford, spelled T U D O R, means T W O. And um, then um, the hero goes through a mood of Calvinist or existentialist despair, and then he sees the skunks. One dark night, my Tudor Ford climbed the hill skull. I watched the love cars. Lights turned down, they lay together hull to hull where the graveyard shelves on the town. My mind's not right. A car radio bleats, love, oh, careless love. I hear my ill spirit sob in each blood cell as if my hand were at its throat. I myself am hell. Nobody is here. Only skunks that search in the moonlight for a bite to eat. They march on their souls up Main Street. White stripes, moonstruck eyes, red fire. Under the chalk, dry and spar spire of the Trinitarian Church. I stand 
on top of our back steps and breathe the rich air. The mother skunk with her column of kittens swills the garbage pail. She jabs her wedge head in a cup of sour cream, drops her ostrich tail, and will not scare. Let me read you uh, a passage uh, uh, from a letter um, which, um, which I got about a year before uh, he died. He says, I gather from your phone call the summer has had some very hard moments for you. It's miraculous, as you told me about yourself, how often writing takes the ache away, takes time away. You start in the morning and look up to see the windows darkening. I think the ambition of art, the feeding on one's soul, memory, mind, etc., gives a mixture of glory and exhaustion. I think in the end, there is no end, but a lot of meat and drink along the way. Freud said, what is pleasure? It is a release of tension between something buried and troubling in the conscious mind. And when there is a spark between the two, that is pleasure. Now, we get that pleasure in immense ways from love. It purges us, as Aristotle said, of pity and terror. <laughs> The humor and the gentleness, too, appear in the poetry rather suddenly. Lord Willie's Castle is a stern, difficult, in some ways almost forbidding book. But by the time we get to life studies, a, a great warmth and humanity enters the poetry and off and on remains there up until the very last book, which is, I think, as warm a book as any that he wrote day by day. Very touching, moving, gentle book, also tinged with... Uh, a sense of his own pain and the pain that he's given to others. The manic phases were not productive. Whenever he went into a manic phase, he couldn't write. One of his most memorable statements in all the years I knew him was his saying that it's terrible to think that all the suffering I've gone through and all the suffering I've caused was due to the fact that I didn't have enough salt in my brain. He made family life available as the subject for American poetry. A lot of the greatest works of American art are about the family. Long Day's Journey in the Night is about O'Neill's family life. I'm sure the Death of a Salesman is about Miller's family life. The Sound and the Fury is about Faulkner's family life. The roots of some of the most powerful American works of art are in family life, and it's a subject that poetry if it were not dramatic poetry, simply hadn't touched. Lowell was continually trying to be American, not just to keep up, but to get into the core of what it was to be American. What was the sound of American speech? I mean, now, okay, you may say at the beginning of his, you know, of his writing in Lord Weary's Castle and the other poems, that that's, you know, where is the Americanness in them? But he's right out of a tight, biographical, pressured situation. As he got older and expanded and got restless, and sort of fed up with the drive of the pentameter, he looked for something that would have the immediacy of the everyday thing. Um, like a simple poem like this, walking along, uh, you know, on a gray day, maybe the shore of Jersey. This is about my home city, New York, and uh, it's called the Mouth of the Hudson. It's rather hideous. You look across into the cliffs of New Jersey, and probably nothing, it's industrial land, nothing is so godforsaken except the Negev Desert in Israel. The poem, in a way, pays a tribute to somebody who's on the Jersey Shore, like, who is William Carlos Williams. In other words, the poem is not a tribute to Williams, but by that time, he had taken in whatever he could use from Williams. Also, the line itself, the feel of the poem, it has an arc, a kind of a casualness of if someone were holding a rod and the line at the end of the poem can pick up anything that's in the river. A single man stands like a bird watcher and scuffles the pepper and salt snow on a discarded gray Westinghouse electric cable drum. 
You cannot discover America by counting the chains of condemned freight trains from 30 states. They jolt and jar and junk in the siding below him. He has trouble with his balance. His eyes drop and he drifts with the wild ice ticking seaward down the Hudson like the blank sides of a jigsaw puzzle. The ice ticks seaward like a clock. A Negro toasts wheat seeds over the coke fumes of a punctured barrel. Chemical air sweeps in from New Jersey and smells of coffee. Across the river, ledges of suburban factories tan in the sulfur yellow sun of the unforgivable landscape. This little Wordsworthian nature poem. I remember asking him about admiring the line, you know, a simple, ordinary line like Westinghouse electric cable drum. He and Harriet were walking, and she kept jumping on some old drums, and she just kept saying, Westinghouse electric cable drum, you know, which, and he picked that up as part of the, of the, of the meter. Um, then the, the sound of the poem, too, if he said the word coffee, it wouldn't be coffee. He had a very, it was like smoke almost at the end of it, rather. So it was very delicate, his, you know, very soft, very southern in a way, you know, coffee. You know, the, I suppose, the famous story of how uh, Ford Maddox Ford, I mean, met in Boston or somewhere, uh, and uh, Lowell said, I, I'm going to be a poet, and um, with whom should I study? Ford said, Alan Tate. Tate very politely wrote back and said, oh, we'd love to have you come, but it, it's just so crowded here now that you'd have to live in a tent. And the next thing they knew, <laughs> here, here, they looked out in the front lawn, and here was someone pitching, uh, urinating in the bushes first, and then pitching a pup tent on the lawn. And <laughs> Tate, uh, like everyone else, immediately recognized his genius, and, and he did indeed. They even let him in the house. I never knew I was from New England until I was about 20 and was living in the South, and everyone described me as a Yankee. And for the first time, James Russell Lowell seemed to be an asset, not a burden, <laughs> even though he wasn't the most popular poet among the Southern fugitives. Um, but I suddenly got a sort of historical sense of being from New England, being different from the Southerners. And um, when I first began using New England scenery, I was living in the South, in Tennessee, and uh, it took some sort of distance to realize it. And, uh, I was early obsessed with the idea of the Puritans and what succeeded them and some sense of history. Harvard didn't mean so much to me. I stayed there a year and a half, and uh, I wanted uh, some exemplar of modern poetry and uh, couldn't find one there and got rather bored with what I was taught in a somewhat foolish, arrogant way. And uh, then I transferred to Kenyon College, and. Uh, studied with John Crow Ransom and lived in his house. And uh, I think that was just to save my life, really, that it gave an environment for me. And uh, I learned a good deal in class, I think, but even more outside in casual conversation and gossip. You couldn't imagine two poets more different. Ransom was a rather small, apple-cheeked, cheerful southern gentleman who's full of utmost courtesy at all times. And... Um, Cal was a rather boisterous uh, young man. Randall Jarrell came at the same time. He was our house mother. They called us the poets. <laughs> Milton, I think, was somewhat his ideal. And in a way, he was uh, rather like Milton. He was scholarly, very scholarly. And everybody knew it. There was no question. We, we knew he was going to be a great poet. The brackish reach of shoal off Madiket. The sea was still breaking violently, and night had steamed into our North Atlantic fleet. And the drowned sailor clutched the dragnet. Light flashed from his matted head and marble feet. He grappled at the net with the coiled, hurdling muscles of his thighs. The corpse was bloodless, 
a botch of reds and whites. Its open staring eyes were lusterless dead lights or cabin windows on a stranded hulk heavy with sand. We wait the body, close its eyes and heave it seaward whence it came, where the heel-headed dogfish barks its nose on Ahab's void and fired. When I was a student, um, I studied with Ivor Winters at Stanford, who was a friend of Lowell's teacher, Alan Tate. And Winters was still, as an old man, grumbling. Uh, Lowell was, of course, not young to me. He was in his 40s. And uh, Winters, in his lectures, always referred to him as that young Lowell. And I remember him saying, when he was speaking about earlier English poets who enjammed lines badly, he grumbled and said, young Lowell has got a bad enjambment, and I think he learned it from Alan Tate. Uh, it's a brilliantly bad enjambment, if it is one. Uh, and you get it here, for example. Had steamed into our North Atlantic fleet when the drowned sailor clutched the dragnet, light flashed from his matted head and marble feet, things being cut off, ended too soon, ended at a place where they lurch on and begin. Rhyming and near rhyming, which feel to me like somebody kind of shooting furiously at target, not caring whether they hit it or not, just shooting out of the angry energy of shooting. I first uh, met Robert Lowell in 1941 through his wife, Jean Stafford. I was her editor, and uh, she was working on her first novel, Boston Adventure. She had married Lowell, I think, just a few years before that, 39 or 40. He was very quiet, very intense person, and he presented me with a copy of his very first book, which was privately printed, The Land of Unlikeness. Jean said, Cal has a, a new book of poems, and it was Lord Weary's Castle. And I guess you can't really say that Lord Weary's Castle was a bestseller, but it was a very, very big seller. And uh, one of the most successful books of poems I myself was ever involved with. Sailors, pitch this portent at the sea where dreadnought shall confess its hell-bent deity. When you are powerless to sandbag this Atlantic bulwark, faced by the earth shaker, green, unwearied, chased in his steel scales, ask for no Orphean loot to pluck life back. The guns of the steeled fleet recoil and then repeat the horse salute. The poem is a political poem, and it's a poem about World War II, though the war doesn't really enter into it. The full title of the poem is The Quaker Graveyard in Nantucket for Warren Winslow Dead at Sea. Warren Winslow was Lowell's cousin, a young man who was an ensign in the Navy and went off to war and lost his life. The rage of the poem is partly the rage at that loss, at, at the senselessness of the loss of sending generation after generation of kids off to fight in a war. Uh, from Lowell's point of view, a fruitless war. Uh, the astonishing thing about the poem, the kind of brilliance of the conception of the poem, was uh, making it a poem not about World War II, but about whaling. <laughs> Seagulls blink their heavy lids seaward. The wind's wings beat upon the stones, cousins scream for you, and the claws rush at the sea's throat and ring it in the slush of this old Quaker graveyard where the bones cry out in the long night for the hurt beast, bobbing by Ahab's whale boats in the east. What he sees permanently in the Atlantic, what anybody sees permanently in the Atlantic after they've read this poem, is uh, some revised Lowell version of Melville's Moby Dick in which the whale is always out there crying, wounded. And of course, that hurt beast begins to echo and rhyme with the hurt self of the tide, which is the hurt of Lowell himself, which is the hurt that the nation is doing to itself in war, which is the death of its young. Uh, all of those themes come together and where do they go? Where do you take this violence? To Cape Cod, guns cradled on the tide blast the eelgrass about a water clock of bilge and backwash file the salt and sand lashing earth's scaffold. 
rock our warships in the hand of the great god, where time's contrition blues whatever it was these Quaker sailors lost in the mad scramble of their lives. In the sperm whaled slick, I see the Quakers drown and hear their cry. If God himself had not been on our side, if God himself had not been on our side when the Atlantic rose against us, why then it had swallowed us up quick. It's some version of himself who's lost. And then in, in the sort of dazzling extensions of the poem, because great poems do that, mean in so many different directions. The sailor, Warren Winslow, the innocent victim, also becomes the sacrificial lamb. It becomes a figure for Christ. And the problem of the poem, which is the problem of Rawls' religious belief, is, is there anything that can redeem this violence? Is there anything at all that can redeem this violence? And I, th I think that must be what drove Lowell to Catholicism. But see, Our Lady too small for her canopy sits near the altar. There's no comeliness at all or charm in that expressionless face with its heavy eyelids. As before this face for centuries a memory no nespecies, nequa decor, expressionless expresses God. It goes past castle time. She knows what God knows, not Calvary's cross or crib at Bethlehem now. And the world shall come to Walsingham. Jean Stafford was already converted to Catholicism. I don't think it was that which had an influence on Bowen. I think it was the direction in which he was then headed. His relationship to Jean Stafford, his first wife, was a very tormented and tormenting one. And it began rather hideously with an automobile accident before they were ever married in the first place, in which her face was terribly scarred and scarred for life, uh, scarred in ways from which she never recovered. And the facial scarring was only a sign of some other kinds of scarring. And Lowell walked away from that accident uh, unscathed. And walked away, some people think, from the marriage unscathed, though I don't think this is true. There are too many indications in the poetry itself that he never completely forgave himself for what happened. Lowell met Elizabeth Hardwick at Yaddo at the Writers' Colony at Saratoga Springs in 1948 or thereabouts, and they were married a year or so later. It's hard to remember that in 1950 you didn't fly. So we went on a freighter. Buongiorno. Mary McCarthy had never been to Europe until I think it was 49. And we hadn't been. First there was the Nazi period, and then the war. We had decided to go to Florence, although some people say, why did you go to Florence, especially people who live in Rome? <laughs> and anyway, we did, and we wandered around, and those were much easier times than now, and everything was very cheap, and found an apartment on the Arno. As I look back on things, it seemed very beautiful. In Florence, I remember the Easter service at the Duomo and all the old prelates in their rather moth-eaten velvets and moth-eaten furs, and they let a dove out from the high altar. Once you're there, that's your idea to take in and experience as much as you can. And you do read about the paintings. You read a lot of art history. I think the arts are connected with power in a peculiar way, but it's an oblique way, and often it comes when the power is faded. That is, the great period of, of Italian painting somehow is a period not exactly of power, but of efficiency, that 
snow accident at Florence was a sort of Pittsburgh, we could say, when the great Florentine painting came. Holland, I fought against it. It was very hard living there. And we did go, and it was a very wise and useful and, and interesting and happy experience. But that was Cal's insistence. He had always wanted to go to Northern Europe, and I do think that was... He had tremendous interest in Dutch painting and Dutch history, and then there's the great uh, Bostonian historian Motley's Rise of the Dutch Republic, which he had read as a youth. He wasn't writing much then, perhaps trying to, and that was worrying to him. So there was a kind of lull and a bit of a depression about his work of what to do next. I remember having a nice, quiet conversation with him once in a restaurant in New York, and we were talking about painters and what painters resembled, what kind of poets. And I asked him, what kind of painter would he like to imagine his work to be like? And he said, Vermeer. Life studies, for instance, is an artist's term, you know, studies from life. You go into a situation in which, as if you were entering a painter's studio in which everything is there. Um, you see the shavings in a sculptor's studio, you see the, you know, the brushes in a painter's studio, and all the fragments are there. All his knowledge, everything he knows, everything, his reading, his, his life, his past, everything, um, is right there and comes to him line after line without a conscious intention of making something as serene and as heraldic as, say, poets in the Middle Age. It's not like Yeats saying, Yeats has found a sound. Lowell never settled on one sound. And that was a tremendous year in Rome. It was one of the great holy years, being 1950. And they announced the dogma of the Assumption of the Virgin into heaven. And I guess that had not been dogma until 1950. <laughs> the poem is about several things, but its main subject is that um, it's supposed to take place on a train going from Rome to Paris. So the, the train literally goes over the Alps. And um, the poem is about people who go beyond nature, uh, Mussolini or the Pope. And I've always regarded the poem as a declaration of my faith, the lack of faith. And uh, what it means theologically, I think, is impenetrable. <laughs> Beyond the Alps is clearly an announcement that something is changing in life studies. The poem still recognizably belongs to the style of the earlier poems, but that style, so clotted and so intense, had to change. Uh, you just, there was no way that anybody could write a poetry at that pitch of intensity and uh, stay there. Uh, a young man starts out at a shriek, he's got to find a way down to another tone of voice. 
And as he does, he also turns from Catholicism as a form of salvation to his own art as a form of salvation, which is really what he believed in all along. Reading how even the Swiss had thrown the sponge in once again, and Everest was still unscaled, I watched our Paris Pullman lunge mooning across the fallow alpine snow. Oh, Bella Roma. I saw our stewards go forward on tiptoe, banging on their gongs. Man changed to landscape. Much against my will, I left the city of God where it belongs. There, the skirt-mad Mussolini unfurled the eagle of Caesar. He was one of us only, pure prose. I envy the conspicuous waste of our grandparents on their grand tours. Long-haired Victorian sages accepted the universe while breezing on their trust funds through the world. The poem has an almost Looney Tune quality, and it begins to have something that Lowell brilliantly had for the rest of his career, the ability to take stuff out of the newspapers, out of the headlines, set it down, uh, in the context of other things that are going on and make a kind of symbol out of the most bizarre dailiness. Bombastic Mussolini, the sawdust Caesar, comes to his end in the gutter. He led his country to ruin when he threw his lot in with Hitler. A fitting climax to a life of treachery and double cross. When the Vatican made Mary's assumption dogma. The crowds at San Pietro screamed Papa. The Holy Father dropped his looking glass and listened. His electric razor purred and his canary chirped on his left hand. The lights of science couldn't hold a candle to Mary risen. At one miraculous stroke, angel winged, gorgeous as a jungle bird. But who believed this? Who could understand? Pilgrim still kissed St. Peter's brazen sandal. The Duce's lynched, bare-booted skull still spoke. God herded his people to the coup de grace. The costumed Switzers spoke their pikes to push. Oh, passed through the monstrous human crush. Life Studies was a watershed book for Lowell. His early poems, of course, were very concentrated, very inward. In life studies, he, he adopted a much more conversational, freer style, the so-called, I hate the word, confessional style. But of course, it was the result of his having worked for three or four years on his autobiography and going over his past, his childhood, his parents. Lowell early wrote poems about knocking his father down, the one poem that appears in Lord Weary's Castle. And this sense of rebellion figures in a great number of poems, not only regarding his own actual father, but in all paternal figures, in all authority figures, uh, in sending a letter to the President of the United States announcing that he would not fight in the war. I mean, <laughs> there are other less demonstrative uh, and less self-aggrandizing ways of refusing to fight. There's a time when Churchill and Roosevelt met and said we tend to burn something in ruthless to destroy, and we're saturating Hamburg and the northern German cities, the civilian population, and the, they announced their policy of the unconditional surrender. Well, then it seemed to me we were doing just what our Germans were doing. And I was a Roman Catholic at the time, and we had a very complicated idea on wars called the unjust war, which is impossible to define. But it's obviously a possibility that there can be two kinds of wars, and one that merges into the other. This seemed to me clearly unjust. So I refused to go to the army and uh, was sent to jail. I went to something I think is called the West Street Jail in New York, a sort of clearing house. It had all kinds of people, two sort of labor pimps, Byoff and Brown, 
very powerful people who leave the jail every day with their lawyers. But the most famous inmate was Louis Lapke, who was head of Murder Incorporated. And it did just that. You paid Murder Incorporated something and people would disappear forever. Poems are always about two things. They're about whatever they're about, and they're about language. Lepke was real, Lowell was real, and he's writing about what he remembers about that. This poem is obviously about two different experiences. It begins as he is recovering from illness to stay in a mental hospital, as he explains. He's talking about himself in the beginning and his house in Boston. Only teaching on Tuesdays, bookworming. <laughs> he wouldn't say, you know, just hanging around reading or something. It was bookworming. Only teaching on Tuesdays, bookworming in pajamas fresh from the washer each morning. I hog a whole house on Boston's hardly passionate Marlborough Street, where even the man scavenging filth in the back alley trash cans has two children, a beach wagon, a helpmate, and is a young Republican. I have a nine-month daughter, young enough to be my granddaughter. Like the sun, she rises in her flame flamingo infants wear. These are the tranquilized fifties, and I'm forty. Ought I to regret my seed time? This is the prosperous fifties or sixties. He's got a whole house on Marlboro Street, surrounded by wonderful furniture. His daughter, his wife is taking care of him. Uh, he's well fed, well clothed, well housed. Uh, somehow he remembers a time years ago when he was, uh, as he says, a fire-breathing Catholic CO. I was a fire-breathing Catholic CO and made my manic statement telling off the state and president and then sat waiting sentence in the bullpen beside a Negro boy with curlicues of marijuana in his hair. Sentence to a year I walked on the roof of the West Street Jail, a short enclosure like my school soccer court, and saw the Hudson River once a day through sooty clothesline entanglements and bleaching cocky tenements. Strolling, I yammered metaphysics with Abramowitz, a jaundice yellow, it's really tan, and flyweight pacifist, so vegetarian, he wore rope shoes and preferred fallen fruit. He tried to convert Bioff and Brown, the Hollywood pimps, to his diet. Hairy, muscular, suburban, wearing chocolate double-breasted suits, they blew their tops and beat him black and blue. I was so out of things, I'd never heard of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Are you a CO, I asked a fellow jailbird. No, he answered, I'm a JW. He taught me the hospital tuck and pointed out the T-shirted back of Murder Incorporated Tsar Lepke, there piling towels on a rack, or dawdling off to his little segregated cell full of things forbidden the common man, a portable radio, a dresser, two toy American flags tied together with a ribbon of Easter palm. Flabby, bald, lobotomized, he drifted in a sheepish calm, where no agonizing reappraisal jarred his concentration on the electric chair, hanging like an oasis in his air of lost connections. He had a breakdown in Boston. He couldn't write. He was very unhappy over that. And he was sort of thinking of writing these things about Uncle Deborah and so on, which he actually wrote in prose. And I said, well, why don't you just write it in prose? 
He kept some of it and made 91 Revere Street out of it. And then there was the hospital, and he was always very humiliated and disturbed for a long time about those episodes. And I, I did say, well, why don't you just write it down? It wasn't long before he was breaking it up and putting it into poems. My last afternoon with Uncle Deborah Winslow. I won't go with you. I want to stay with Grandpa. That's how I threw cold water on my mother and father's watery martini pipe dreams at Sunday dinner. Fontainebleau, Mattapoisett, Vancouver. Nowhere was anywhere after a summer at my grandfather's farm. Well, this is the house where Bobby used to stay in the summer. I lived in the house across the street and he used to lend him books. And the books were about adventures, boys who had adventures and found pirates and smugglers. And his mother didn't like his reading about that because he liked to pretend he was a smuggler or a pirate and went off in his rowboat. And she brought all the books back and said, please don't lend Bobby any more books that give him ideas. I picked with a clean fingernail at the blue anchor on my sailor blouse, washed white as a spinnaker. What in the world was I wishing? Sail-colored horse browsing in the bulrushes, a fluff of the west wind puffing my blouse, kiting me over our seven chimneys, troubling the waters. Small as sapphires were the ponds, Quiticus, Snippetuit, Massawampsit, halved by the island, where my uncle's duck blind floated in a barrage of smoke clouds. Double-barreled shotguns stuck out like bundles of baby crowbars. No matter how casual and seeming it is in life studies, how throwaway these lines seem to be, they are not constructed as his earlier lines always were, my God, out of granite, you know. Still, they were created language. My uncle was dying at 29. You are behaving like children, said my grandfather, when my uncle and aunt left their three baby daughters and sailed for Europe on a second honeymoon. I cowered in terror. I wasn't a child at all. Unseen and all-seeing, I was Agrippina in the golden house of Nero. Near me was the white measuring door my grandfather had penciled at my uncle's heights. In 1911, he had stopped growing at just six feet. While I sat on the tiles and dug at the anchor in my sailor blouse, Uncle Deborah stood behind me. He was as brushed as Bayard, our riding horse. His face was putty. His blue coat and white trousers grew sharper and straighter. His coat was a blue jay's tail. His trousers were solid cream from the top of the bottle. He was animated, hierarchical, like a ginger snap man in a clothes press. He was dying of the incurable Hodgkin's disease. My hands were warm and cool on the piles of earth and lime, a black pile and a white pile. Come winter, Uncle Deborah would blend to the one color. It's terrible if you're bound to the f photograph of your past, which I think I was in my studies, but I, I don't reject that that's all right, that's a decent book. But I don't want to write another life studies, another photograph of what I did. And that's quite a problem. Of course, you cheat and change things in the supposedly exactly true story of your mother and father. But on the whole, it seems as though it exactly happened in that kind of language. And it's a real problem to get around to things that won't seem as though they exactly happened. You know you're inventing them. This is called for the Union dead, and it's a good deal of embarrassment if you're a New Englander that the writing in the South has been so superior to ours in this century, I think. And uh, they 
go to town on the Civil War. Many of my closest friends have been Southerners, and uh, we've had this bone to pick between us. And it certainly hasn't done great things in literature, the modern Southern writing, particularly Faulkner, but others. And uh, I've never done this kind of thing before, and I don't think I will again. But it was read on the Boston Public Garden last spring. There's a great monument in Boston, our finest monument, uh, done by St. Godin's Henry Adams friend of the Shaw on his horse and the regiment marching with him. And it faces the State House. And um, when it was unveiled, William James spoke at it, and uh, Justice Holmes spoke at another ceremony. So that this is deep in tradition. And um, the day when Shaw and the Negro regiment marched through Boston, I think it was 1863, Two months later, Shaw and about a third of the regiment were dead, attacking a fort off Charleston. For the Union dead. The old South Boston Aquarium stands in a Sahara of snow now. Its broken windows are boarded. The bronze weather vane cod has lost half its scales. The airy tanks are dry. Once my nose crawled like a snail on the glass. My hand tingled to burst the bubbles drifting from the noses of the cowed, compliant fish. One morning last March, I pressed against the new barbed and galvanized fence on the Boston Common. Behind their cage, yellow dinosaur steam shovels were grunting as they cropped up tons of mush and grass to gouge their underworld garage. Parking spaces luxuriate like civic sand piles in the heart of Boston. A girdle of orange, puritan, pumpkin-colored girders braces the tingling state house shaking over the excavations as it faces Colonel Shaw and his bell-cheeked Negro infantry on St. Gordon's shaking Civil War relief, propped by a plank splint against the garage's earthquake. Two months after marching through Boston, half the regiment was dead. At the dedication, William James could almost hear the bronze Negroes breathe. Their monument sticks like a fishbone in the city's throat. Shaw's father wanted no monument except the ditch where his son's body was thrown and lost with his niggers. The ditch is nearer. There are no statues for the last war here. On Boylston Street, a commercial photograph shows Hiroshima boiling over a Mosler safe the rock of ages that survived the blast. Space is nearer. When I crouch to my television set, the drained faces of Negro school children rise like balloons. Colonel Shaw is riding on his bubble. He waits for the blessed break. The aquarium is gone. Everywhere, giant, thinned cars nose forward like fish. A savage servility slides by on Greece. The old South Boston Aquarium stands in a Sahara of snow now. The word snow contains now in it, snow now. Uh, it also implies, uh, for the moment, it stands in a Sahara of snow. But underneath the snow, there's a Sahara. So there's like a prediction of the bomb. What you feel is that the aquarium, which is going to be dry, that that's a condemned building to a kind of doom that is possible from the atomic bomb. I don't see why anyone would want to intend pessimism or optimism, but you don't want to think of that. And, uh, you want to think of what you feel. Then you're very astonished that what you feel falls into a groove you maybe didn't intend.
Our next guest is a man who many speak of as the greatest poet in America. But I have a better introduction for him, which is he was intimate to an invitation from the White House for an intimate tea and ceremony. But Robert Lowell was a poet. And let me enforce upon you one notion. Poets come rarely from the middle class. They come, they come from the top and the bottom. Now I'll introduce Mr. Robert Lowell, who, if I were to fulfill this in true fit ass MC fashion, would have to be announced as coming from the top. Oh! <laughs> We're all very different. Our styles are different. Our points are different, and our poetry is different. And uh, Cal said to me, he said, "You know, it's so funny. Here in Boston, they think I'm Norman Mailer, and in New York, they think I'm Robert Lowell. And this was Norman Mailer's, you know, wife-stabbing period, and so forth. I mean, in Boston, he's felt to be so sort of outrageous and unpredictable, and sort of." Awkward. Whereas in New York, people think he's a gentleman. <laughs> These terrible events of the last three months, perhaps are the strongest tribute I could give to my friend Senator McCarthy about why he's so necessary. There are three short poems. One has something to do with Columbia outburst. The second is an elegy to Senator Kennedy. And the third has directly something to do with the Martin Luther King's death. A lot of sonnets were coming very quickly, and uh, he let them come. I think he felt that he didn't altogether choose for this to happen. They were lines, clumps of lines were, uh, would come banging through his head, and he had to uh, get them down and make some order out of it. Things that he had been thinking about, reading about, musing about. All his lifetime, suddenly he could get into a poem. Cato, Cleopatra, a translation of a sonnet about uh, Hannibal. There was a kind of explosion of the possibilities of what could actually get into his work. And then there are passages borrowed from... Uh the writings or conversations of others, letters, for example. These appear in Dolphin, for example, that put him in a very embarrassing light. There were a lot of people who advised against that. The reception of the Dolphin um, and the controversy about the Dolphin before it came out reflected an extremely naive sense that somehow this book was going to be uh, simply a record of uh, the breakup of his marriage to Elizabeth Hardwick and marrying Carolyn Blackwood. But of course, Elizabeth Hardwick doesn't write letters in iambic pentameter. And when he says in the poem Dolphin that the book is half fiction, he means it. I mean, the book is by no means a record of what she said uh, or wrote to him in any, at any one moment. And even the, the plot, the structure of the story, is not at all the plot and structure as it happened in life. It's a work of art. Um, he writes in a letter in 1976, Dear Frank, so good to hear your voice. I've just been talking to Lizzie and felt a rush of health. My recovery has been easy in most ways, but I'm weighed down by the new frequency of attacks. How can one function if one is regularly sick? Shades of the future prison. But all's well for the present. The doctors differ somewhat, but are optimistic. So am I. We sit by the fire paying bills. Carolyn has written three chapters of a novel. I've written a short, heartfelt poem. Now, I want to end on a dying beat. <laughs> Not too hard to do. A little poem that's an epilogue to a long sequence. Those blessed structures, plot and rhyme, why are they no help to me now? I want to make something imagined, not recalled. I hear the noise of my own voice. 
The painter's vision is not a lens. It trembles to caress the light. But sometimes everything I write with dim eyes and threadbare art seems a snapshot, lurid, rapid, garish, grouped, heightened from life, yet paralyzed by fact. All's misalliance. Yet why not say what happened? Pray for the grace of accuracy Vermeer gave to the sun's illumination stealing like the tide across a map to his girl, solid with yearning. We are poor passing facts, warned by that to give each figure in the photograph his living name. Thank you. Major funding for the Voices and Visions series is provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Annenberg Media. Additional series funding is provided by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. For information about this and other Annenberg Media programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.